Hi guys, uh, my name is Anthony. I'm the founder and CEO of Lucid. Today I want to explore multi-chain fragmentation in DeFi, the opportunities and the threats associated. I'm going to start by running you through a history of the Ethereum ecosystem, how we got to where we are today. Obviously, there's a few challenges that we're facing with, the, with all the proliferation of L2s, L3s. So we're going to run deeper into what those issues actually mean. And then we're going to run through the potential opportunities and the different solutions that we can have as approaches uh, to resolve these things moving forward and building the ecosystem that we all want to see. So starting with the genesis of Ethereum back in 2015, obviously Ethereum launched. It was a completely new type of blockchain technology. Um, obviously the, pre the whole premise was based on smart contracts where you could have if this, then that logic. This was a revolution compared to the traditional Bitcoin oriented approach where you could have UTXOs, which meant that you could basically just send, receive and hold an asset, which in itself was a revolution in the early days, but was not flexible enough to accommodate the types of computer science that people wanted to experiment with. And that's why smart contract technology was such an important innovation in the space. And I would say it's been the most important innovation since the advent of Bitcoin. Moving on from the initial launch, we moved to the experimentation phase. This is when people were basically trying things out to see what would work. Some things, well, most things didn't work. Um, there's many failed attempts at uh, uh, building the future of the internet of money, um, but some things did. And it was on those early learnings that we've now started to evolve, started to compound that knowledge, being able to refine the approaches and be able to move in the direction that you can now see today manifest through this specific event. Uh, the third phase was the growth and optimism phase. Based on those early learnings that we'd made, we started to see, okay, certain things are working. Now we want to start building consumer-facing applications that can scale. This is when you started to see the, the, the launch of projects like Aave, the projects launched like Uniswap, of Curve, basically the DeFi primitives that have formed the foundation for the entire space. Um, at that point, you could start to see the future of where everything was going. There was a lot of hope and optimism back in those early days, 2020, 2021. People uh, might remember this specifically for DeFi summer. Uh, people were, you know, there was a lot of innovation. There was a lot of deep VC money slushing around the space. Everyone was too busy counting uh, all of their riches. And then suddenly, everything shifted. Unfortunately, the market crashed. As we all know, it was a very rough bear market. And in that bear market was when we started to see the L2 oriented Ethereum roadmap come to fruition, which had many benefits, but also had many costs associated. The benefit is, of course, that with the proliferation of all of these different L2s, now we have way more block space that we can play with, which means faster transactions, uh, faster finality, being able to build different ecosystems with different specializations, different communities with different ethoses, and which was an amazing thing and was also the intention of the Ethereum ecosystem. The problem is, of course, that when you have all of this proliferation without the proper interoperability standards, you start to fragment. You fragment liquidity, you fragment users, you fragment governance, and fragmentation is unfortunately the position that we are currently in. Obviously, there's lots of different approaches. Everyone's trying to solve this issue from various different angles. And whilst there are approaches that will work, a lot of these technical implementations that we're talking about, the Ethereum Foundation is discussing, will take years. The question is, what can we do in the meantime to minimize the pain and maximize the benefits and help the Ethereum ecosystem grow in the ways that we all want to see? So going a little bit deeper into the issues. So what's the issue with liquidity fragmentation? Well, if you deploy to a new L2, you're starting from zero. You're not able to carry forward any of the liquidity that you had previously. You have to then start considering, okay, are we gonna start bridging liquidity in from other ecosystems? Do we wanna generate everything again organically? Do we wanna re-engage the old community to come with us? Do we wanna engage the local community and try and build a strong foundation there? And so there's a lot of considerations and it's a very difficult process. Like if you look at some of the biggest DeFi protocols that have been deployed, you'll see that they have a lot of success or maybe one or two chains, maybe even three or four. But then as you start going out, you start seeing massive de deplet depletions in the rate of traction, the rate of liquidity and asset growth on other chains. So there's a lot of risk associated with that because if you are a very successful DeFi protocol, you're on two, three chains, things are looking really healthy, things are looking good and you wanna grow, you wanna bring your ecosystem, you wanna bring your product to more people to bring uh, more choice to the space, but then your product fails on the ecosystem, it's a really bad reflection for the entire project, even if you had a lot of success elsewhere. 
Then obviously the issues surrounding bridges. Which bridges do you use? How are you doing the due diligence? Do you want to use different bridges for different ecosystems? The biggest hacks that have ever happened in Web3 all happened through bridges. I mean, people are obviously aware of the wormhole attack. They're aware of the jump attack. Um, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars have been lost in these, in these attacks. And whilst security standards are improving, it's still taking far too long. There's, these are honeypot attacks that are being, that are being, that are being executed by nation state sponsored hacker groups like this is the kind of risks that, that we're taking where you have literal teams in north korea that have been trained for decades to know exactly how to attack your bridge in the fastest way possible to inflict the maximum amount of damage and to walk away with those funds having washed them through various centralized exchanges the third problem is that teams struggle with treasury management across all these different ecosystems Again, even if you decide that you want to use certain bridges, you're comfortable with the trust assumptions and you're bringing in your assets, often you're going to be moving your own governance token. And the question is, you don't want to have full exposure to governance token on one chain or on many. You want to have a diversified treasury. But to do that, obviously, you're selling assets into the open market. It affects prices. And also, treasury diversification is a problem that we're, we're facing uh, on a very significant level. If you go to deep DAO and you look at the treasury composition of a lot of these projects, uh, the treasuries are often 99% exposed, or even 100% exposed, to their own governance token. This is a huge problem, because in crypto, there's a lot of micro movements of trends. And if you're unable to diversify your treasury when you're when your trend is relevant and your prices are pumping, then when the, when the trend inevitably shifts, you're going to suffer uh, and your treasury is going to be decimated, uh, as we've seen uh, time and time again. So exploring different solutions, how do we actually solve these different, uh, these different problems? One of the solutions, I think, is obviously modular architectures. Uh, modular architecture stands in opposition to monolithic, whereby you can upgrade certain components of the organization without having to scrap the whole organization uh, as you go. Modularity obviously exists on a spectrum where you can go from more to less. We want to be moving in the direction where we are moving progressively to more modularization so that we can swap in and out of these different components of these multi-chain DeFi projects without having to re-audit and rebuild everything um, time and time again. As well as that, I think a lot of DeFi teams are not actually aware of the scale and scope of all the smart contracts available in the space that have been there have been some of some of them were birthed in the early 2020 21 DeFi summer. Some of them have been birthed more recently. DeFi teams I speak to are not aware of the full breadth and depth of the smart contracts available that could optimize their experience in the multi chain world. So, in my opinion, one of the roles of someone in the space should be to go out, find all those contracts, bring them under one roof, educate the, 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 the DeFi founders, DeFi teams on what they should use, and then help them use them. Thirdly, Sometimes you are going to have to innovate. Obviously, smart contract aggregation is great, but there is still a lot of innovation that needs to be done along the journey. And so the idea is figuring out exactly what the needs are of the community, how they can be built, executing on the builds, and then bringing that product to market so that everybody has access and hopefully leveling up across the entire space. Third, um, you can, uh, sorry, fourth, you also have technology partnerships. Sometimes it makes sense to innovate. Sometimes it makes sense to aggregate. Sometimes it makes sense to integrate. For me, it makes a lot of sense that you would find specialized partners for different components of your organization where they can take on a lot of the technical uh, implementation risks, they can focus on a specific component, and they can execute as, uh, as well as, as they can, and you can rely on them. You want to minimize your dependencies, of course, but it is inevitable, and so you have to be very diligent in who you integrate with and how you do the risk analysis. Thirdly, we, uh, sorry, fourth, fifthly, <laughs> we need to secure bridging solutions. As I mentioned, different bridges have evolved the security standards, but it's still not good enough. Like, bridges are still hacked all the time. There's failures, there's, um, there's vulnerabilities that are found. And so we need to continue to evolve in this direction, which I'll get into a bit more later. Uh, and then finally, we need unified governance. For off-chain governance, you can still have unified governance across multi-chain ecosystems. But for on-chain governance, you can't, really. And so this is a problem because off-chain governance is great for small to medium-sized DeFi protocols. But as you get bigger and more successful, and as the space evolves and brings in more money, we need to have less trust assumptions, not more. And that's when on-chain governance becomes relevant. And in the multi-chain world, we need on-chain cross-chain governance. And so this is something that I think is a really un underexplored space and underappreciated space, which is ripe for innovation. 
So at this point, I'm happy to introduce my attempt to solve these issues. Uh, the platform that I'm building is called Lucid. It's what we call a modular hub to enable multi-chain DeFi. I was speaking to DeFi founders that face all these various issues, and I started to think, okay, what would I do? What, what can I do? What can I contribute to solve these different things? And so when I say this is a modular hub, we're bringing together various solutions in the form of modules that can abstract away the complexity of going multi-chain, minimize uncertainty, and then helping them manage at scale. So let's dive into more of what that actually means. Okay, so here you can see uh, some of the some of the information surrounding the project. The five stages of actually joining the platform is you choose and configure the different modules. You deploy them across the different ecosystems. At that point, you can do multi-chain liquidity management and you can do multi-chain operations with no coding required. We have three main modules on the platform, which I'll dive into in more detail now. So firstly, we have the bonding engine. As I mentioned, when you arrive at a new L2, the worst thing that can happen is if you, no one adds liquidity inside your DeFi contract, no one adds liquidity inside your, your uh, DEX pools, and the project basically looks dead. The way that you can mitigate that is by coming to our bonding engine, setting very specific liquidity and TVL targets for each ecosystem, and then tying those targets together with a discount on the governance token, which the community can then use as an incentive to meet those targets for you. So you can specify the exact contract that they want to have the liquidity added to, the exact pool. Then you create the bond with the discounts. The community can then see all of that's available. And then they can see which discounts they want to they jump on. They can then, at that moment, bridge to those relevant ecosystems. They can interact with your DeFi protocol in the, in the way you want by adding that liquidity. They then get an LP token, which they can then sell via the bonding engine to the treasury in exchange for a discounted governance token that is vested to you. So this is important because you can set very specific targets and you can be very conservative in your discounts. You can come in and say, okay, I'm willing to pay a 3% premium to get this liquidity. So you create that, those bonds, you push them live, and you see how the community is. Are they receptive? Are they actually doing this for you? If they do, then happy days. You've only lost 3% to get this minimum level of traction. And if they're not, then you can go back and increase that discount. You can increase it to 5%, 7%. And again, you can be conservative in your approach. But this allows you to have a very granular management over your liquidity and whilst also engaging the community at the same time. So it can be traditional community members that are going to go and interact in a certain way because they already love your project and they want discounted governance tokens. Other community members from other, from other communities are also going to be stumbling across your project because of the bonds. And it really opens up um, this whole other avenue for you as well. So this is a, yeah, so this for us is a really com important component of liquidity management. Obviously, you're moving different assets from different chains. Uh, we're also working with router protocol, which is an intense base protocol, whereby you can go from any asset on any chain to any bond on any chain in under 20 seconds with just one click. So this is going to be a very streamlined operation where the projects can come and they can deploy across, they can deploy their DeFi protocol over multiple chains. They can then come in, set these liquidity, liquidity targets, and because they know that they will have those targets met, which they will know because there is a, a market there, now they can be more aggressive in their growth plans and they can be sure that this is going to be a minimum level of attraction on which they can then build an organic ecosystem. And a good example of that is if you're a lending market and you want to deploy some to somewhere new, um, you can then say we're going to have a, we want to incentivize a million dollars of supply side liquidity on this certain chain. Once you've got that liquidity, people can now borrow against it at a low interest rate to kickstart that organic growth. So this is a really powerful way for every DeFi protocol to go multi-chain. The second module is the multi-vote module, which, as I was saying earlier, I think on-chain, cross-chain governance is something that has been massively um, underappreciated in the space. On-chain governance is really only relevant for large DeFi protocols, but in all of the chaos and experimentation of uh, the DeFi market at the moment, you can see that there are a few big players that are coming to fruition. It's no, it's no um, coincidence that the biggest DeFi protocols are already um, on-chain governance oriented, so that's you know, Aave and Unisot and uh, Compound, but they're not yet cross-chain enabled, and more DeFi protocols are gonna be crossing that threshold to be considered large, 
uh, behemoths in the space, especially now as the bull run kicks in, as more and more assets come into the space. You know, we're already we're already uh, a multi. I think there's a hundred billion dollars already locked in. TVL inside of the Ethereum ecosystem, that's going to be moving to trillions of dollars over the next few years. And many of these projects are still in off-chain governance. This is an unacceptable compromise. There is too many risk assumptions involved in that. So we need to enable on-chain cross-chain governance, which is where the multi-bridge module comes in. You can have voting enabled from any L2 or any L3. You can then relay those votes down from any of those chains to the base chain where you have your governor contract implemented. This can be one token, one vote, or quadratic voting with Sybil resistance. You can also, as the project, configure which bridge you want to use and which bridge you want your community to use. You can even enable multiple bridges if you want to. You can have failover on those bridges. So it's not only the most comprehensive, it's also the most flexible system. Okay. And um, I'll quickly run through the multi-bridge module, whereby uh, this was actually a module that was requested by our, one of our launch partners. They wanted to compete with Aave v4. In their v4 architecture, Aave said, we have successful votes on Ethereum. We then use one bridge to communicate those proposed instructions to all of our deployments. This is not safe in case that bridge is compromised. And so they create a system whereby they send the same message through three trusted bridges to each deployment. Only when two of those bridges agree on message integrity is it allowed to execute. So are they built that for themselves? We have built that for everybody else. Not only is it compatible with message relaying, it's also compatible with asset transfers. So by leveraging the XERC20 standard, we can allow projects to move massive volumes of governance tokens or any of their native tokens from chain A to chain B, burn them natively on chain A, mint them natively on chain B, send those mint and burn messages through the multi-bridge module to each relevant ecosystem. Only when it's had at least two of the three bridges confirm the integrity is safe, then it will do the execution. This is the safest way to do large volumes of asset transfers in the space. That has existed. You have no dependency on a single bridge, no matter how good you, you think your bridge is, it is a risk. Whereas if you have two bridges at the same time that need to be hacked, then your, your, your risk of, of, um, of failure, or the risk of hack is infinitesimal. Uh, so this is uh, the multi-bridge module. It's also compatible with snapshot governance, with safe, with tally. So if you want to create these proposals, you can either execute them initially th via the platform or you can export that data to snapshot, you can export that data to safe. So you can have off-chain governance that triggers on-chain execution of message relaying for small contract upgrades across your ecosystem or asset transfers as well. Yeah, I'm just gonna quickly wrap up and say that these are our partners. So we're integrated with Hyperlane, XLR, Chainlink, Layer Zero, Wormhole, and Connex as the bridges. We're currently being audited by Hellborn. We have a few under integration partners as well that you can see here. Um, so we're happy to say that through Lucid, projects can be become the most sophisticated multi-chain organizations in the world. Uh, we are launching in two weeks' time. Uh, we have secured a few major DeFi protocols. We'll be securing around a billion dollars of TVL. And so if you want to reach out to me, you're a DeFi project that is multi-chain or wants to go to multi-chain, please do reach out. I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much.